Okay, so as discussed in the last chapter, what we're going to do now is we are going to go over and add like some variations to the height. So we already have like a really nice and clean looking graph over here, so that's looking quite good. Normally I don't work so clean when doing personal projects, but oh well. So, uh, this is going to be very easy actually. The first thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and we need to add another flat fill node. So this flat fill node we will actually be using a lot, so that's why I'm fine with just using like one of them. Now, to create like the angled variations that you can see in our reference over here, there is actually a perfect node for this, and it is called flat fill to gradient over here. And basically what with this node, what you can do is you can turn up the angle variation, which will literally give all of your pieces separate uh, different variations based upon the angle, as you can see over here. So this always works really well for this kind of stuff. Now we will use this flat fill node for a few more things later on, but for now, now that we have these pieces, the next thing that I want to do is that, as you can see over here in our reference, and also just in general with like many of these cracks, there isn't really that much space between the cracks over here. See, they are literally just sitting right next to each other. There's like a tiny bit of space, but not a lot. While over here, if we would do this, there would be a lot of space between them. And that always feels a little bit basic, and I don't really like that. So I'm going to go ahead and fix this. The way that I tend to fix this is I tend to go ahead and add a, uh, let's see, a blend over here. And then what I want to do is I want to get started, first of all, by adding a something that is called a non-uniform blur grayscale over here. If you just type in non, there we go. Okay, so for this node, we will have the grayscale, which is going to be just like our gradient. And then we need to have a blur map. Our blur map is basically going to be this map, but inverted, because it just means wherever we have the cracks. So if we just go ahead and type in invert grayscale over here, we can plug in our blend and we can throw this into our blur map, which will give us like this little overview over here. Now at this point, I tend to just boost up my samples to the point that I feel like it's good. So let's go for like 10. The higher your samples go, the more expensive it is. So just try not to go too much over here. Mm. Yeah, and I think for my blades, I want to only go for like five blades or something like that. So I want to just keep it because it's quite an expensive note to use often. So we have this note over here. And I'm going to plug this note in the bottom like this. And then what I want to do is I want to multiply this using a bevel note, which will give us like a little bit more of like a nicer look in between these edges. Also, the edges are very harsh. So I might want to just go ahead and like work on that also by blurring them like a tiny bit just in general. But anyway, let's add a bevel note over here. And for this bevel note, I will need this one over here. So just plug this in here. And then in your bevel note, you need to plug and you need to boost your distance way down over here. And you just want to like here, you want to do something like this where it's like very low 0 0.005, maybe something like that. So you just get like this uh, soft flow off. You plug this into the top. And you multiply this and then just tone it down a little bit in your opacity to like 0 0.5. There we go. So it will give you like a difference. So we go from this to this. But you can see that there is also like a difference that they actually go down. So they are not just like a flat look. They actually go downwards, which in our height will mean that it will just nicely go down. Now, as I said before, I do not like this harshness over here. And I think it is best if I... Yeah, because the flood fill, flood fills are really bad with gradients. They just want to see white and black. So after we've done our flood fill and our flood fill to gradient, I'm going to add a very quick blur, high quality grayscale. And I'm just going to tone that down, but you just give it like a little blur, maybe 0 0.1. There we go. And I think that that just in general will make everything feel a little bit nicer. So if I do this, and it feels like, oh, this is because I'm blurring it. But then because we have this mask over here, uh, the mask is not reaching it. So in that case, what I would recommend doing is, yeah, this is not too expensive. So I can just as well, like, here, plug this in here also so that we have like a double blur. And let's see, there we go. See, so now it's like a lot softer. Okay, perfect. 
So we add that and that will now make our shapes hopefully go really close together. And what we can always do is we can always try and also push them closer in, in these areas over here. So we have, here we have our blur. So if I go into this blur and set this to like 0 0.03 for example. Here see, let's go a little bit lower and that should hopefully still, we can now, now we can properly check if it still works. Because if the flood fill shows errors and you will see it very clearly if there are errors, then you know that they are not thick enough. So I quite like this. So our um, smaller cracks are thinner sized than our larger cracks. And then in the end, we just get something like this. Perfect. Okay. So now that we have something like this, now what we're going to do is I think it is time to actually preview this inside of Marmoset Toolbag so that we can just have a look at our material. So right click and add material and call this height underscore variation. Now I'm going to save my scene. And at this point, I just want to go ahead and I want to start exporting my texture. If I go here, export outputs as bitmap, I can go ahead and I can go into my source files. And if we just go into textures, uh, I just call this V1, because in case I want to have multiple variations, I can always export those. Select the folder, target file, um, and we can go ahead and turn on automatic exports when outputs change. Now I am aware that I forgot to actually plug them in, but uh, else I would need to redo the settings if I don't press the export outputs button. And now I can just go ahead and I can plug this into my normal map. I can plug this into my height map over here. And if I just press space and add an ambient occlusion map, hold control and just duplicate your node. We can also add a quick ambient occlusion map, which will also give you like a better feeling. Now the AO map is very expensive, but if you turn on GPU optimization, it becomes very cheap. So we got this one also over here. Um, I'm not yet a big fan of like these lines, but we will just check them out, shall we? Uh, in our normal map, I always work in OpenGL because I feel like I can read everything better in OpenGL. And also when I see over here, so if I set this to like 2 in the intensity, yeah, I can see that I might want to go ahead and just uh, in my non-uniform blur probably. Let's see, if I set the samples up. No, it might actually be in my bevel. So if I set my smoothening in my bevel up, yeah, I think that's the one. Hmm. See, no, you know what? No, that's not the one. Let's have a look. So, this one, our blades, it might be our blades. I just need to figure out exactly where this problem lays. And I just do that by simply moving around my sliders to have like, yeah, here. So, it's the blades that is being a problem. And if we just go into our blur high quality grayscale, this one is probably also a problem. However, at this point, I think it is better if we just add like an extra blur at the end over here, which I was going to do anyway. So let's do blur high quality grayscale for now. We will not keep this blur. It's just for the height map mostly. And if I just go into my normal here, if I set this to 0 0.1, 0 0.07 maybe. Yeah, let's do 0 0.07, something like this. Okay, perfect. So we got this stuff. And because we turned on our automatic exports when outputs change, whenever we make a change like this, it will automatically export. So what we're going to do now is we're going to load up Marmoset Toolbag. Okay, so here we are inside of Marmoset Toolbag 4. Now, if you want to get the exact same render as I have, I would recommend that you use Toolbag 4 because we are going to use ray tracing and Toolbag 3 does not have that functionality, which will make the quality a little bit less nice. What I also have for you is in your source files, there is an exports folder where I have a sphere to tiles. This is the actual sphere that you can also find in Substance Designer in the 3D viewport. You can find this in your installation folder of Substance Designer and then going to resources. So it's just a sphere that has, that it's just a UV unwrapped sphere, basically. Just drag it in. Now, because Mama said toolback, uh, this tutorial is really about creating a uh, procedural material, really a smart material. It's not really about mom's toolbag. So I'm going to just go over this very quickly. I will not go over the UI or anything like that. What I tend to do is I tend to first of all go to render, turn on my ambient occlusion. This will just add like a little bit of ambient occlusion. And I just tend to set the strength up a little bit. Next, I want to go into my output. 
and I want to set my output resolution to 2560 by 2560. Basically, whenever we render an image, we want the image to be square, and I will show you why. Set the format to be JPEG, and I will show you why now. So you have your main camera over here. However, I always like to create a new camera for this. So I like to right click and add the camera. In camera one, if you turn on safety frames and set the frame opacity all the way up, the safety frames will reference the resolution that you have in your render, which means that now we are in camera one, which you can switch between over here. And I can simply now set this camera wherever I want it to be. Now, so that is going to be our camera, that's going to be for our camera one. Uh, I'm going to go to sharpening and set it halfway. I'm going to go to bloom and set it slightly above the size node. I don't even know the values. I just know the positions out of my head. And the vignetting, you can see you can add as much or as little as you want. That is camera one. Next, what we have is we have our sky. So this is the default sky and I really just need to see my material in order to really know which sky I want to go for. I do personally tend to go to presets and I tend to grab a different sky and the sky that I tend to grab and the one that I happen to already know that I want for this case is going to be our, um, I'll be able to find it, the name when I see it. Uh, it's like Lagoon Blue or so something in that direction. Yeah, Lagoon Coast Dusk, that's what it's called. So I just double click on it. Hmm. Looks a little bit dark. You can hold shift and you can rotate it around. So I think for now, I think what I'm going to do is maybe, yeah, I'm just going to temporarily pick like a different one. I'm temporarily just going to pick like uh, Ellie Nero. Wow, they are also dark. When, if they are, if they feel very dark, you can always go in and set your brightness like a little bit brighter over here. So let's set it to 1.5. Now at this point, we do want to add some lights, of course, but first we will add our material. I can just use my default material for this. So what do we need? We need a displacement map. So go into displacement and turn on height. We need a norm map, albino map, roughness. Well, we don't really need a metallic, but we'll just leave it. And we need an occlusion map. Now that we have that, the first thing that we can do is we can go ahead and we can go into our textures, V1. And over here, we already have three of the maps. So we can plug in our displacement map. We can plug in our normal map. And we can plug in our ambient occlusion map over here. And now, first of all, let's tone down our ambient occlusion. And this will not look very good. That, that makes sense. This is because we need to add displacement to our actual sphere. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to textures. And I'm going to set my tiling over here to 2. This will just give me like a little bit more tiling. For your displacement, for now, let's just tone it down. And what I can also do is, first of all, I just want to go ahead and like play around with my camera. So I want to set my camera to be pretty much like flat in the center point, like you can see over here. After this, you can also play around with your offset to play around to just uh, rotate your texture around. So when I have my camera in a position that I like, I tend to press the lock button over here. This lock button will basically make sure that I do not accidentally move my camera around. If I want to move around, I just go to my main camera up here. I then right click, add light, and I add a directional light. This is going to be our first light over here. Now I'm just going to go ahead and move this light into a position that I can still see it in my main camera over here. And now I can just use W, E, and R to switch between my pivots. Or you can switch between them up here. I'm going to rotate this light. And move it sideways. By the way, in your material, just set your roughness to be a bit lower. And I basically want to get this light to come from the right view down to the left view. And I want it to basically encase around half of the sphere. Like this. You can then also go in and like maybe set this a bit brighter. So for now, let's set this to 6.5. But because we don't have a texture yet... That is already very bright. And if you go into your color, you can go ahead and you can give it like a very slight orange color. Now that we have this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press Ctrl D and duplicate this light. This light will become a rim light. A rim light is basically a light that is just 
on like the very outer bits here. You will be able to see it. So it's basically going to be like a strong light. Sorry, it's a bit tricky to rotate it sometimes. It's going to be like a strong light over here. That is just sitting on like the very outer bits. And this light will just like catch some of the reflections. So we set this light often at like, I do two of them. That's always my standard. It's a three point lighting. I do one at the top. And uh, yeah, so you play around kind of like with the brightness right now. We want to keep it quite low. And I like to make this one always like a little bit more of like a bluish color. And then I also duplicate this and I do one. And this one is going to be at like the bottom over here. And the bottom one is going to be even stronger. And that one is going to be like a white color. That's often like the workflow that I do. Of course, right now it will look still quite silly because we don't have a lot going on here. Now, finally, there's one last thing before we can start with our displacement. And that's going to be our background. For our background, you can always go into sky. And you can set your mode to color to basically just add like a color into your background. However, what I tend to do is I tend to right click and I tend to add a fork volume over here. With this volume, what I can do is I can often just go into my color and it will just give me like a bit of like a softer glow. So I just give it like a color that I like. And then in my distance, I just need to set my distance quite high. So often maybe like a thousand or maybe even two thousand is already fine. And then you can like play around here and you can just set like basically the color that you want. But the goal is that later on you can like play around with it. And just can, you can very easily make everything feel a little bit foggy. So I'm going to go ahead and set this to 1500. And just in general. Uh, I learned this technique from Javier Perez. Which is a really cool material artist. So credits for that technique go to him. So now that we have this stuff. And we have already a basic setup. We can of course just do a quick file and do like a save as. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to save this in saves. And call this render underscore scene. And now I'm going to show you how to do the displacement. So for displacement, we basically set already our displacement scale in our material up a little bit. And this is different inside of Momster Toolback 3. In Momster Toolback 3, you will have another function over here for tessellation. In Momster Toolback 4, you need to go down here to your sphere. Click on the sphere and press subdivide. And then you basically just want to go ahead and you want to keep... Increasing this. And uh, we are going to go quite high. We're going to go probably to like five subdivisions. Something like that. Which as you can see. It will definitely increase your material a lot. Or uh, here we go. So 12 million polys. For 24 million triangles. And now you can see that here. It will be a little bit slower of course with this many. Uh, especially when you do not have a really good graphics card like I have. Because I'm still waiting for mine. So over here, you now basically, you can set your displacement to get something that you like. And now we can already like start seeing the effects. Now that we have this, what we can do is we can go ahead and we can turn on ray tracing. Ray tracing will actually make a very large difference in this type of material. So when, as soon as we go to render and turn on our ray tracing, it will be a bit slow because it needs to um, turn it on. But then what you can see is that the quality will even improve a lot more. See? Over here. Now you can see down here a bar that it is loading. And when it is done loading it will just do like an automated uh, noise optimization. And this is what we got now. Now one, one thing that you will see me do is whenever I change my displacement. I turn off my ray tracing because else it's very slow to do. So I just basically play around with my displacement until I get something I like. And now you can already see that we already start to get sort of like these effects that we have over here. And that's basically the goal. So now that we have done our setup and we have this piece over here, what we're going to do next is in our next chapter, we are going to break up the edges a little bit more. We are going to balance out our, um, just like our general shapes and just make them look a little bit nicer inside of Marmoset so that, because this is like a little bit too over the top. We are going to mask out some of the smaller pieces that we have almost like a few pieces missing. And once we've done that, we will just do like some general improvements and we will start then adding like these smaller cracks, which are like surface cracks, as you can see over here, which are slightly different than these ones. So let's go ahead and continue with that in the next chapter.